Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our end of term lecture. We're pleased to welcome Professor Turner of the Sleep Research Foundation of Scotland. Professor Turner carries out research in order to understand insomnia in people of all ages. She's particularly interested in helping people to create the best conditions for falling asleep quickly. Here to tell us more about it is Professor Turner. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you're well aware of how important sleep is for your health. Unfortunately, we often find it difficult to fall asleep when it's most important for us to get a good night's sleep, just before an exam or a big match or some other event that's making us nervous and stressed. The thing is, you need to be relaxed in body and mind in order to fall asleep. And in times of stress and exam pressure, relaxation is the last thing on your mind. You don't fall asleep because you're worried, and then you get more worried because you know how important it is for you to be asleep, and you go round in circles not falling asleep. So, what can you do to fall asleep within 10 minutes of going to bed? Here are a few simple tips. Firstly, take a hot shower or bath before bedtime. The hot water will help your body to relax and when you get out of the bath or shower, your body temperature will drop. This is important because your body temperature needs to drop by 1 degree centigrade so that your metabolism can start slowing down. Secondly, Make sure you have good curtains or blinds in order not to wake up early when the sun rises. Thirdly, try to avoid screens, the TV, computer and telephone in the hour before you go to bed because they stimulate the mind. Having just told you to avoid your phone, there are actually some apps that can help you fall asleep. An app with breathing exercises is very effective and if that doesn't work, you can use the Sounds of Nature app and listen to the sound of rain falling. You can also use an app to track the number of hours and quality of sleep in order to be more informed about how you're sleeping. Finally, you should go to bed at the same time every night so as not to upset your body clock. Now, I think that's all we have time for, but I'd just like to finish with my personal favourite method of falling asleep. When I can't fall asleep, I try to force myself to stay awake. It works every time. Thank you, Professor. Professor Turner will be taking questions now as... We're at the London Show Business Awards and we're talking to Laura Martinez, winner of the Newcomer Award. Laura, you've already appeared in a TV series and you've had great reviews for an album you released last month and you're only 17. How did you do that? Oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, I don't know. I'm lucky, I guess. I've always wanted to be a performer and I put some videos online and that's how I was discovered. So would you tell other young musicians and actors to put videos online and wait to be discovered? It's one way to do it. Ed Sheeran did it that way. Ed is one of the most successful singer-songwriters of all time. His albums are always in the charts and his hit single, Thinking Out Loud was the first song to be streamed half a billion times on Spotify. That's enormous. Very impressive. Ed Sheeran's great. He started doing live gigs when he was very young, didn't he? That's right. He moved to London when he was 16 and started playing small venues. He has a lot of fans and he had a hit single which reached number one before he even signed a recording contract. Let's talk about your acting. Who are your role models? 
I am inspired by Millie Bobby Brown. She plays the part of Eleven in Stranger Things. I love the way she plays that character. Oh, yes. The audience love her too. Stranger Things had over 8 million viewers two weeks after it came out. Millie has that star quality, the kind of talent some actors can only dream of. Exactly. Did you see the cast of School of Rock collecting their award for Best Musical? Yes, they're amazing. They're only 12 years old and they have to put on a show four times a week. I want the lead guitarist and the lead singer to play on my next album. Well, Laura, good luck with that and thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks. A viral video is a video that becomes popular very quickly through the internet. People share the video through social media and email. The first real viral video came out in 2005, the year that YouTube was created. The video is unusual because it's not particularly interesting. It shows one of the founders of YouTube speaking to camera for 19 seconds about the elephants in a zoo. There isn't a formula for a viral video hit, but the most popular ones have three things in common. Firstly, they tend to be short. People have short attention spans, especially when they're looking at websites, so the most successful viral videos are around three minutes long. Secondly, they stir up your emotions. They may be funny, sad, shocking, entertaining or even extremely annoying, but they make viewers feel something. The third ingredient is story. Many of the most popular viral videos tell a story, and the ones with an inspirational ending are the most memorable. A viral video is a video that becomes popular very quickly through the internet. People share the video through social media and email. The first real viral video came out in 2005, the year that YouTube was created. The video is unusual because it's not particularly interesting. It shows one of the founders of YouTube speaking to camera for 19 seconds about the elephants in a zoo. There isn't a formula for a viral video hit, but the most popular ones have three things in common. Firstly, they tend to be short. People have short attention spans, especially when they're looking at websites, so the most successful viral videos are around three minutes long. Secondly, they stir up your emotions. They may be funny, sad, shocking, entertaining or even extremely annoying, but they make viewers feel something. The third ingredient is story. Many of the most popular viral videos tell a story, and the ones with an inspirational ending are the most memorable. I have to tell you about this video I saw. Somebody sent me the link yesterday and I think I've watched it 30 times. It's absolutely amazing. It's this boy, he must be 13 or 14, playing the piano at a school concert. At first I thought, why has she sent me this? Then the boy started singing. Wow, his voice! It really took me by surprise. He sings Paparazzi by Lady Gaga, which is one of my favourite songs anyway, but he sings it so well. He's got the kind of talent other singers only dream of. I watched an interview with the boy afterwards and he's so sweet. He got a recording contract all because of this video that his mum posted on YouTube. He's so inspiring. 
My favourite videos are the ones that make you laugh. It's usually because somebody does something stupid. For instance, there's a video of a man who dives into a frozen swimming pool. Well, I say he dives, but of course he hits the ice and slides across the swimming pool. How can you be so stupid? Then there's another hilarious clip of a girl walking along in a shopping mall. She's texting and she isn't looking where she's going. And she trips over and falls into a fountain. I couldn't believe it. I'm not sure why it's so funny to see people having silly accidents. But perhaps it's because it makes you feel better to see how stupid other people are. Also... These viral clips contain an element of surprise, something unexpected. I love the one where a baby bites his brother's finger. The little brother puts his finger in his baby brother's mouth, and surprise, surprise, the baby bites it. I love the expression on the baby's face. He's very pleased with himself. Hi. My name is Nigel Brown and I'm in advertising. I watch videos all day, especially videos that get more than one million hits on the web. These are the kind of viral videos that our clients want. I love my job, but when I was growing up, I dreamt of being a famous singer. My parents told me that you had to know somebody famous or you had to have famous parents. But that's all changed now. Anybody can post a video of himself on the web, and any of you could be famous by next Saturday. Of course, it isn't that easy. There are over 100 hours of video uploaded to the net every minute, and only a few have more than 1 million views. So, how do you predict the kind of video that will go viral? I'd like to give you some examples of successful videos. Jessica, is that you? Yes. What's the matter? You sound upset. Upset? I'm absolutely furious. That's it. I am never going to give an interview to that magazine again. Oh dear. What happened? They know I'm serious about my profession. I've done Shakespeare. I've made films with some of the best actors in the world. I've written a screenplay and I've just directed a film that's been nominated for an Oscar. That's right. So, what went wrong? They didn't ask me about my work. They asked me what I was going to wear to the Oscars. They asked me who I was dating and why I'd split up with my fiancé. They asked if I'd put on weight and whether I was on a diet. They asked you what? Yes. And that's not all. They wanted to take photographs and they asked me to wear something feminine. Then they asked me not to look too serious and to blow a kiss at the camera. <laughs> blow a kiss? Who do they think I am? Marilyn Monroe? This week's Media Report asks the question, do young people watch television? And if so, what do they watch? In the studio with us, we have Professor Moore of the Centre for Media Studies. So, Professor Moore, what did you find out about the viewing preferences of 16 to 25-year-olds? According to our research, the youth of today watch a lot of TV particularly online series. The preferred genres of 16 to 25-year-olds are fantasy, science fiction, silly humour, cool vampires and cookery programmes. Hang on, did you say cookery programmes? That's right. The latest news is that food is the most popular new reality TV format. According to research, we spend more time watching food on TV than we do cooking it. And 50% of people watching top food programmes like The Great British Bake Off are 16 to 25-year-olds. So sugar is the star of reality TV. <laughs> exactly. 
The format of the Great British Bake Off is so popular that it has been copied in numerous different countries all around the world. The Australians love it, as do the French, the Americans, and the Poles. Another very popular series is Master Chef, a competitive cooking show that originated in the UK in 1990. Entertainment comes in many forms, but young people of today really love cookery programs. But do people actually make the cakes and dishes themselves? Some do. A survey was carried out on how TV programs influence people, and the information collected suggests that 20% of viewers admitted to making dishes at home. Just so they could take photographs and share them on social media. The interests of young people are so difficult to predict. Surely they live on spaghetti, fast food, and takeaways, and life is too short to stuff a mushroom. What use is information about how to serve shellfish or ice wedding cakes? Good point. I think there are three factors that explain their popularity. First. These programs have excellent TV presenters. Then there's the fact that this generation is creative, and cooking is one way of being creative. And finally, there's the competitive element, which made Bake Off and Master Chef semi-finals and finals the most watched TV programs of the year. Well, that's very interesting, Professor Moore. Thank you for coming in. Now we're moving on to. Could you lend me your calculator? Well, okay, I suppose so. Is it okay if I use your phone? Oh, I'm sorry, but the battery is flat. Do you mind if I open the window? No, not at all. Go ahead. We were wondering if we could leave early. Sure, I don't see why not. On the show today, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the famous Notting Hill Carnival in London. I love Caribbean culture, and the festival is great fun. But you can enjoy it even more if you go well prepared. And believe me. I learnt the hard way. Most importantly, you need to wear comfortable shoes. Leave the high heels at home because you can't dance in them, and never, ever wear sandals. You won't come across a bigger street festival in Europe. It's crowded, and I promise you, other dancers will step on your toes. You don't want to spend the rest of the day with sore feet like I did. What is absolutely fantastic about the Notting Hill Carnival is it changes the mood in London. There's an amazing party atmosphere, and a lot of it is thanks to the parade. It looks like the Rio Carnival in Brazil, with the floats and the crowds of people dancing in the streets. And although everyone would agree that London is a great city, it isn't exactly famous for its vibrant colours. Well, for one weekend a year, it just explodes with every colour under the sun. The makeup and costumes of the performers are the brightest I've ever seen. I love the crowds, the noise, and the carnival atmosphere. Everyone's so happy and lively. Every year, our dance teacher makes us work hard, and we practice until our feet are sore. When our families come to watch us in the parade, we want to make them proud. Mum always tells me that I'm the best dancer in the group, which probably isn't true, but that's okay. I enjoy it anyway. The Notting Hill Carnival was and still is a time for people to get together and have fun. I'm really glad someone came up with the idea. I'm extremely lucky. I live in Notting Hill, so the carnival is practically on my doorstep. 
It gets fairly noisy here, but I don't mind all the performers and the Caribbean music at all. Of course, the streets are pretty crowded too with all the visitors. Apparently, over a million people attended this year. Some local residents told me that they found the carnival rather annoying because it made it difficult for them to come and go. But really, it's only on for three days. I love every minute and always look forward to it. Excuse me, madam. Who me? Yes, you. Can I have a look in your bag, please? My bag? Why? I mean, yes, of course. I don't think you've paid for these items, have you? Oh dear. Um. Yes, of course I've paid. Can I see your receipt, madam? Receipt? Uh. Yes. Let me see. Oh dear. I was going to pay, but I forgot, and then. I'm not guilty, honestly. I didn't kill him. I wasn't even there. Where were you at 8 p.m. that evening? Then it's important for you to have a good alibi. I was playing football. Can you prove it? Yes, I was with a group of friends. We played against a team from another town, and we won. I'm innocent. Okay. Give me some names, and I'll contact them. What games have you got on your phone? Boring ones. Anyway, it needs charging. Got anything to eat? No. Oh, I'm bored. Why did you do that? Don't know. I felt like it. Come on, those buildings over there are empty. Let's break the windows. Yeah. Okay. Nobody move. You, hand over the money. Put it in this bag. Come on, hurry up. Right, give me the bag. Okay, let's get out of here. Hello, fire service. I want to report a fire. There are some empty buildings near here. They're on fire. I saw two boys running away. I think they set fire to the building. Are you in immediate danger? I don't think so, but it's a big fire. Okay. What is your address? It's twenty-four Ravenscroft. Hey, what are you doing? Ow! Get off! Help! Stop him! He's taken my bag. Are you okay? No, my arm really hurts. Let me help you. He took my bag with everything in it. Oh no! Okay, I'm going to call the police. Thanks. This week, our special report asks: Are we doing enough to help young offenders to become better citizens? Today, three out of four young offenders who are released from prison go on to commit another crime. And return to prison. These statistics suggest that young offenders' prisons are failing. The government are carrying out a review of the system. They say they want to improve young offenders' access to education, but some people believe that the prisons are already too soft. They think that you should make an example of teenagers who break the law. They want harder and longer punishments. To talk to us about that, we have seventeen-year-old ex-offender Daniel Smith in the studio with us. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Daniel. You've recently been released from a young offender's prison. What's it like inside? Noisy. There's a lot of shouting and fighting. Fights happen every day, and for silly little things. We're locked in our cells at eight fifteen at night, and we can watch television until two a.m. If we do something wrong, they take our television away. I see. So, tell us about the opportunities for education. 
we could choose from about 50 different subjects. Everything from music production to gardening to cooking. I did about 20 hours of lessons every week. You're paid for each lesson you go to, and then you can spend that money on sweets or phone calls. You're paid to go to lessons? Yeah. Nobody would go to lessons if we weren't paid. It isn't much, 40p a lesson, but I was motivated because I knew it would help me to get a job when I came out of prison. This woman came into the prison and gave us all this information about qualifications and jobs. I chose the lessons that would help me get a job. Basic subjects like English and maths. And then I did accounting and computer skills. I'm working now, and that makes a big difference. How many of the other young offenders were as motivated as you to learn new skills? Not many. A lot of them are happy the way they are and don't want to change. Is it true that some young offenders like being in prison because they have a better life inside than outside? Yeah, that's definitely true. One of my mates was homeless before he came into prison. He was worried about being released. In prison he got food and clean clothes and a warm cell. Outside he was living in a box on the street. The day he was released, he walked into the prison car park and smashed the windows on five cars in the car park. He was back there in a few days. Hmm. Well, that brings me to another point. The government want to improve conditions in young offenders' prisons, but some people say that this is wrong. They say that these are young people who have committed crimes and they should be punished. One prison guard said, They have education, they have a gym and television. It's like a holiday camp. What do you say to that? But it's not a holiday camp. We can't see our friends or our family. Doors are locked. I don't want to go back there. If you want young people to change, you can't lock them in a cell and expect them to change. You have to educate them and make them believe that there is a better life in front of them. Simple as that. Judy and Mike were living in a detached house halfway down a nice street. Their house looked like the other houses, but in fact, it was the unluckiest house in the neighbourhood. In a period of five years, they were burgled thirteen times. After each burglary, they had something done to their house to make it safer and more burglar-proof. First, they had the locks changed. Then they had a new front door fitted. That didn't work, so they had a wall built. Nothing stopped the burglaries. After the seventh time, they bought a dog and had a big sign put on the gate saying, Beware, dangerous dog! The dog was too friendly, and they were burgled again. After the thirteenth time, they were desperate. Finally, Mike found out on the internet that according to statistics, the highest number of burglaries happened to detached houses halfway down a street with a purple door and the number 88. They couldn't get the house moved to a different location, but they've had the door painted green and they're going to have the house number changed. Mike's sure that with a green door and the number 86B on it, they'll never be burgled again. In today's podcast, we want you to ask yourself the question, am I doing everything possible to protect myself online? If the answer is, I don't know, I hope this podcast will help. Here are our five top tips for staying safe online and not falling victim to identity theft. Number one, passwords. Let's begin with a weak password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is weak. 
don't use it. Here are some more. Password, football, I love you, Star Wars. If you use one of these, you can only blame yourself if a hacker gets into your account and steals your identity. Use strong passwords with a combination of symbols, numbers and letters. To save yourself some trouble, use a password manager. Go to our website for links. A final word on passwords. Keep them to yourself. Even with your best friends, don't tell one another your passwords. Number two, personal information. Hackers and identity thieves want your information. So when you're online, you should be careful when somebody you don't know asks you to provide information about yourself. It could be a fake email or message. Delete it. When you get a friend request on a social networking site from somebody you don't know, don't ask him or her to introduce him or herself. Just delete it. Number three, viruses. Don't open files or attachments if you're not sure what they are because they may contain a virus. An email virus can send itself to all your contacts. If you let a virus into your computer, it then attaches itself to other programs and each time you run your programs, you run the virus too. For links to antivirus software, visit our website. Number four, software updates. There is a simple way to protect your files. Update regularly. When you get requests for updates on your apps, do it. When you update a file, you also download the latest security. Viruses update themselves all the time, so you need to update regularly too. Number five, your digital footprint. Be careful when you and your friends send each other videos and photos. Remember they're likely to stay there for a long time. Don't post anything you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. I think I'm going to do voluntary work this term. How about you? Maybe. What are you thinking of doing? I'm not sure. You're really good at maths. How about teaching younger pupils? You could help them with their math homework. Oh no, I'm not patient enough. Teaching isn't my thing at all. I don't have any younger sisters and brothers, so I'm not used to young children. I'd rather visit an elderly person. Well, that would be a very good thing to do. I can't teach younger kids either. They annoy me. And um, to be honest, I'm not very good at any school subjects. That's not true. You're good at art. Why don't you help pupils with art projects? Hmm, I don't know. I'm really into vintage clothes, so I suppose I could organise a second-hand clothes sale. Actually, I think that would be good fun.